I'm gonna take her up, boys okay. and girls. Whee! <laughs> All right. Hello and welcome everyone to Game State episode 27. It is Monday, February the fourth. I'm gonna say the fourth. The fourth. I'm gonna say fourth. I am your host, Adam Winners, your Ragsdale, and with me, as usual, are Glenn Jones, event coverage coordinator for Star City Games. Hello. Steven Flavel, poker pro and magic enthusiast. Hey, everybody. And Cedric Phillips, professional wizard. Hi, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about Star City Games Atlanta, largely the standard open portion as it was the first large event in the new Gate Crash standard, but also a little bit of the legacy. And that's about it. It's going to be a fairly short show this week. So let us get right into it. The standard open in Atlanta was won by Joseph Herrera with Naya Humans in a top eight which was... In, in true modern standard format fashion. One Nia Humans, one Human Reanimator, one Red White Aggro, one Jund Aggro, one Blue White Red Flash, one Four Color Tokens, <laughs> one Jund Midrange, and one Esper Spirits. Totes. So let me grab the top 32 decks from the standard open. I will put them into the chat, but my first question for you fine gentlemen are what are your, what are your first impressions to go general of the Gate Crash standard format? Cedric, take it away. It's time for beatdowns. It's beatdown o'clock, Ooh. and that makes me that makes me a very very happy person because I love to attack. Um, I figured that there would be a lot of aggressive decks this weekend, and there were. Um, I predicted that Mama Red would win the tournament, and even though it didn't win the tournament, I think that uh, you know having one in uh, third place with Red White Aggro, which was just a Mama Red deck with two Boros Charms main, and then Ryan Cruz finishing ninth. Pretty good deck thus far in the format, but as you can see, most of this, most of the decks here are attacking. Uh, Nigh humans, red white aggro, uh, the Jund aggro deck was we uh, deemed it experiment Jund over the weekend. Um, there's just a lot of attacking that's taking place right now, and there are less Sphinx's revelations. And at the beginning of a standard format or a new format where a new set comes in, it's hard to build the control decks right away. So, not too surprised to see aggressive decks, but I do think that the aggressive decks are probably here to stay. Um, because they are, there are a lot of these aggressive decks are actually really good against uh, Supreme Verdict, which is controls, in my opinion, best tool against aggressive decks. So they can't really control Terminus the way they'd like to, and as a result, uh, I think the control decks just aren't going to be that good. While we're in chapeau doffing, doffing mode, before I get to Glenn, didn't you also say that uh, an Unburial Rights deck was going to be good, and that like also did fairly well? I did say that, yeah. I think I think you said that too. So I you did. Just, you hit all the things. Wow, Actual feel, master. It feels good. <laughs> all right, Glenn. Thoughts. What were your thoughts? Yeah, I, I also expected a lot of aggro decks, and in an environment like this one, I would kind of even classify like combo reanimator as an aggro deck, since it's you know pre a very proactive deck, just pressuring the opponent with its game plan, and th the onus is on them to defend. So if you look at it in that perspective, like the top four is just all. Very, very proactive strategies. Uh, then you move into the top eight, and you got some weirder ones in there, but Esper Spirits, I think, is a deceptively aggressive deck. Four color tokens, kind of the same. Blue Red Flash, obviously, the closest to a control deck we've got in the format at this point, with Bant having just disappeared. Uh, so, I think that we basically saw what we expected in terms of decks that want to put the pressure on the opponent uh, showing up in week one, which is pretty much what always shows up in week one, or at least what always does well. It's it's rare that a control deck actually performs. The last time I recall it happened was actually RTR, uh, when Todd won with blue-white-red control, a deck that like immediately vanished from the metagame afterwards, you know, yeah. and just had to become flashed. So uh, there's a lesson in that. I think that it's just pretty hard to be correctly positioned for a week, and especially one as diverse as this one. There's just so many different decks. Steven, do you have initial broad thoughts? Yeah, I think, like, obviously it's like the first week and aggro is going to show up in strength in the first week, but I think that having all 10 goals in the format is a really big deal for aggro more so than control. I think that 
that alone is going to push us into more and more aggro as the format progresses, just because the control decks were already able to play three colors pretty comfortably and could get up to four colors and fit in door to nothingness and, you know, just <laughs> play whatever they wanted. And now that you have the full complement of duels for the aggro decks, you're getting to a point where aggressive decks can actually do that too. So you're seeing a big power spike for aggressive decks where they can combine whichever three colors they want pretty much. And Obviously, you don't have to, but the ability to do it means that it's going to be very difficult to account for everything an aggressive deck can throw at you. Alrighty. So in, in keeping with the general theme, before I pull specific topics, I want to know what you guys personally liked the most from this event in terms of specific deck archetypes, and then what we don't, what you guys don't touch on, I will pull into questions afterwards. So, Cedric, what was your, your personal favorite thing? Oh, man, I feel like I'm going to steal this one from Glenn, because I think we both liked this deck quite a bit this weekend. Uh, the Experiment Jun deck. Yeah. <laughs> yep, I knew it. <laughs> um, the Experiment Jun deck looked really, really good. Glenn, I'll let you touch on that one quite a bit, because I know you have some thoughts oh, on that. Oh, you go ahead. You can go ahead. No, dude. no, it's yours. It's yours. Uh, I, I, mean, I still like Mono Red, honestly. Um, and a lot of people are talking in the chat right now about... Uh, about the Saito Red Green deck as well, and that seems like uh, honestly a better evolution of the deck than I actually put forward in my article. Um, I just lo I love the way his deck looks. I was pretty blown away when I saw it. It's all four of 20 lands, uh, and then four, 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 three sideboard. Uh, might be considered a little bit of lazy deck building, but I think his deck just looks awesome um, for what it's trying to accomplish, which is beat the crap out of the opponent. Um, so I still think that mono red deck, the mono red strategies are definitely something that's still going to be good moving forward. And uh, a thing that I heard a lot over the course of the weekend, um, a card that you guys know, obviously I'm in huge support of is Boros Reckoner. And a lot of people came to me uh, while I was in Atlanta, and they were like, look, I knew Boros Reckoner was really good. I didn't know that it was this good. Um, and that was like kind of the common theme among those people. So um, as long as Boros Reckoner is a card, and it's a really actually kind of difficult card to go about beating, um, I think that Red's always just going to be a good strategy. All right. Yeah, it seems like there are a number of different ways you can go with red-based aggro, both the way Saito went with red-green and red-white, and maybe even ways we haven't seen yet, which are, like, very, very reasonable and quite powerful. Okay. All right, Glenn, what do you want to talk about? Yeah, I did really like Tyler Lindsay's Jund aggro deck, uh, the experiment Jund, as we've started calling it. It's really sweet. It makes excellent use of the experiment one. Like I saw him, you know, very casually growing it up to three three on the regular, which is probably above the curve on that card's power level in most decks. Uh, and he can obviously even get it a little bigger than that with access to Thunder Maw Hellkite in the deck. And it's just a really sweet card. He even can grow it multiple times, and he has things like uh, you know Dreg Mangler to put more counters on it. So then it becomes a real monster. Just doesn't die to anything. Uh, that said, you know, it seems like a deck that needs to, a few things to happen. Like, one, it doesn't want to play against Azorius Charm especially frequently. I think uh, a lot of its creatures are really vulnerable to it, while some are good against it. So it's kind of awkward. I really liked Gorklan Rampager in that deck. It was super impressive to watch. Like, you know, some people had been championing that guy pretty hard. I think Chapin has written a couple of things on it now. And I was, an, I was a little skeptical. I was like, yeah, sure, I get it. You know, it's, you get one or the other, and both are fine. Together, they're actually good. Uh, but actually watching it in this deck, it was kind of annoying. Like, you know, you just jam your creatures into these terribly unfavorable combat situations or, like, a, a very obvious Restoration Angel, and your opponent's just put to the decision over and over. They're like, oh, man, like, can I beat the plus four, plus four? Even if I, even if I can, can I beat a four, four? Like, that's actually a really big size in the format. Uh, so I, I like the deck a lot. Its mana seems a little... Uh, bold, perhaps, is the word. Uh, obviously, we've got, like, Stranglergeist on two going into Hellriders on four, and we've got some black in there for our Drag Manglers and Slips and Decays. Uh, to, to Tyler's credit, I didn't really see him stumble in the games that I watched. I don't know if that it happened when we had him on the stream, but in the games I covered him in the uh, quarterfinals, he just, you know, very easily played all of his spells and crushed his opponent rather mercilessly. Uh, another thing I do like about this deck is it's an aggressive deck that can actually tolerate an opposing Boros Reckoner with access to Abrupt Decay and Tragic Slip as cards that remove that guy from the path without actually giving the opponent value, uh, that's that's pretty big. Uh, I think we're going to see Boros Reckoner really redefining the format in the early weeks, as he's a really great weapon for Mono Red, but he's also like 
a super obnoxious weapon if you're playing mono red into Boros Reckoner. Like, that's pretty, like, your Ash Zealots can no longer swing because they'll just kill another guy before that guy even deals damage. It's just really not a good spot. Alright. And I would agree that that deck did look sweet. Steven, what would you like to talk about? Uh, I thought that that deck was the coolest deck, but, like, should I pretend that I thought one of sure. the other ones was cool? <laughs> Make believe, friend. <laughs> Um, I guess it's sort of heartening that someone's still trying to play Flash in this format. So we can talk about that, like, sure. a little bit. <laughs> like, I don't know, because it's a, a very challenging format for control decks, obviously. I feel like a Flash deck is a reasonable place to head if you want to try to try to make that work. And I think the Tanner Lear's Flash deck is, like, completely reasonable. And, I mean, it doesn't have both creatures, so it's a little less exciting. <laughs> yeah. It's good to see at least one person make it into the top eight with a controlling strategy in week one. So to, to sort of expand on that before we get totally off the topic, do you guys think that Bant is just totally dead? Like, do you think Flash is the superior place to be as a control deck? Because that was not my initial impression, necessarily. Let's start. Let's start with Steven. Let's go crazy. Yeah, I mean, I think last week I said that I thought this was a turn four format, which is like pretty old, and maybe it doesn't end up being that way. But I think that right now the format's too fast for Ben, and. I also think that the like major tools that Bant has are very, very easily answered by the cards that Aggro has available to it now. So even if Bant starts to get a foothold again, there are like very, very easy answers. So you think Flash a better place to be in general? Yes, although I don't think it's a great place to be. I, I would be playing something aggressive right now, and I think that what we're going to see is... Uh, a shift towards the mid rangey sort of stuff rather than the full on controlling strategies before we see any control deck in this format. Like, I think we're going to need to see a lot of Headmasters and Drag Tusks, and I don't even know if that's good enough, but we're going to need to see something like that succeeding before someone can pick up a real control deck. All right. Glenn, what do you think about Bant and Flash? Yeah, I think Steven hit it pretty well on the head there. Right now, just I don't even think it's a question of like which of those decks is better. It's like, is either of them even viable? When you're facing such a diverse range of aggressive decks and you've even got stuff like Combo Reanimator lurking in the wings, like you have to be ready to fight on so many levels and so many angles. Uh, until the format settles down, I, I don't even know if we'll be able to play a control deck. So like discussing which one of these like semi-unplayable decks is more playable <laughs> is a little awkward. Alrighty. Said. Um, I mean, I definitely agree with both Glenn and Steven. The big difference now, too, is that um, in the previous format, you know, band control could do its thing, and, you know, decks like Mono Red didn't have access to cards to really stop their best cards. Uh, you can say the same thing for other strategies as well. Whereas now that there are new cards that exist that kind of incidentally prey on what Bant was doing before, um, I mean, an easy example is a card like Skullcrack that Red didn't have access to, and they would just lose to a revelation eventually, and they couldn't do anything about that. And they had to play garbage cards to try to beat Bant, like Arcwing Dragon, a card that I played at Grand Prix San Antonio. It was horrible. It was, not even good. It was terrible. And then when I actually cast it, it just didn't even do what I wanted it to do. It got a Zorius Charm, and I just wanted to throw up. Like, they don't have to play bad cards anymore to, like, beat these strategies, because, like, their cards overall, the card quality in their deck, just got overall better. Like, again, you're, you're playing Boris Reckoner instead of Pirate Art Wolf. Like, your card quality has just moved up. Um, again, like, a card... Um, a card that the the band control decks relied on pretty heavily was Supreme Verdict. Um, they played some number of Terminus, but they mostly relied on, you know, maybe Farseek and a Supreme Verdict and a Thragtusk. Supreme Verdict is at, like, its all-time worst right now, and if you do go towards a deck that is relying on that card to be, like, your main way of, like, re-catching back up in the game, then you're going to see people, you know, playing Boros Charm for its indestructibility. You're going to see more regenerating creatures, you know, a card like Experiment 1. Um, just there's a lot of different ways to go out beating the cards that made Bant so good prior. Um, it just seems like it's horribly, horribly positioned right now. So do you think Flash is any better, or do you just think they're all in the same boat? Like it, It's kind of weird, right? Because I don't feel like Flash really got any new tools. 
um, is the big deal to me. Like the thing, the the color combination that Flash gained in this set was red white. And you know, I was watching some players play Flash. We had uh, Chiho Yim on camera, and like his only update to the deck is Sacred Foundry and Boros Charm. Boros Charm giving him some more reach. Sacred Foundry giving him a little bit better mana. Deck already had pretty good mana to begin with. So, you know, all of these aggressive decks are getting these all cool new updates, and I can actually finally play Flood Move Boar, yay! And, like, all of these cool new cards, and, you know, the blue-white-red deck is just like, oh, I got a duel that I'm not going to play four of, and, uh, yep, I got Boros Charm to give myself some more reach, but it doesn't interact with your creatures, this is awkward. Like, you know, it, it, it's just like you can tell that, like, those decks are having so much success because they were just ahead, whereas now the new guilds are here to put the, uh, you know, your Juns and your, your Gruul, you know, back in a competition, and that's what you saw in week one. Yeah, speaking of, you mentioned Chihoy's deck, which, I mean, Chihoy, he did okay. Uh, I'm going to put his deck link in the chat, but I'm not even sure I would classify this as a flash deck, really. I mean, this is, like, almost an aggro deck. Like, it's basically just a Geist deck. Yeah, he's a little bit more he's a little bit more mid rangey because he does have the Geist and he does have a bunch of reach. You know, you can you can look at Tanner Lear's deck as a more traditional, you know, look at it in the Jerry Thompson, Todd Anderson style of deck. But again, if, if you look at this deck list and you're looking for new cards that Tanner's playing in his deck, I don't I think, think I actually know. I think yeah. Yeah, two Zero. sacred foundries. So there's like no real updates to his deck, and this is like a pretty stock version of this deck. Obviously, he had a good weekend. He made top eight, but. And you just ended up losing, and I think that you're going to end up seeing that a lot with these control decks, that they don't get any new tools, and I think that people are so used to playing around their old tools that they can actually beat them now. Alright. Okay, well let's talk about Naya decks, as Naya humans took down the event, a deck which I think is substantially more interesting now that I am convinced you can actually reliably cast your cards on the turn you want to, with the addition of both Sacred Foundry and Stomping Ground. What do you guys think about Naya decks in general and Naya humans specifically? Let us return to the standard order. Cedric, you may start. This deck is horribly disrespected. And, and I'm 100% guilty of that, so I'm not going to act like it was just you guys or you know some <laughs> people in the booth or whatever. I This deck basically debuted by Ben Weinberg at Star City Games Invitational when we were in Los Angeles. And ended up making the finals. And like we were looking at his deck and we were just like, I don't understand how he's here with like this mediocre Champion of the Parish deck that has bad mana and, like, mediocre cards in this format full of, like, Reduke smashing everyone with bad control and, like, blue white red flash decks. Like, what are you thinking? And now, you know, the last... When we were in Dallas, it won the tournament um, before Gatecrash came in, and now, you know, it got its Sacred Foundries, it's got it's got its Frontline Medics, and it's just a good white aggressive deck. Uh, curves out very well. Uh, Thalia seems to be pretty good again. Um, you know, obviously getting into control strategies, it's okay in your aggro mirrors because it does have first strike. But, I mean, this is just a synergistic white creature deck, because we've seen this before. Um, and the card quality in this deck is high, and it only got better with Frontline Medic. And, you know, it actually is one of the decks where, when you're playing an aggro deck, when you're playing your zombies, or you're playing your, you know, red deck, um, having to play against Restoration Angel is an absolute nightmare. And this is an aggro deck that actually gets to play with Restoration Angel. So, you know, it's good. Restoration Angel's insane against your control decks because it has Flash. Insane against your aggro decks because it has four toughness. So it gets to play that awesome card in its deck, and it also just has a bunch of synergy in the deck. So I, I was definitely wrong about this deck. You know, I was watching Jonathan Herrera play. He didn't lose a match. He ended up going where he had 10 rounds of Swiss, so 13. So 11-0-2 over the course of the weekend. He didn't lose. Um, and, I mean, that's pretty impressive uh, with that deck where I don't even agree specifically with all the numbers in that deck, but the overall strategy seems to be a good one. Do you want to, like, like which numbers specifically are you talking about, just out of curiosity? Yeah, I mean, like, Near Hearth Pilgrim is the main deck card I don't love. Um, that card just seems like maybe something that you'd want in your sideboard. There are better two drops available. You know, maybe you want the fourth Restoration Angel. You maybe want the, the fourth value in your sideboard, so when you sideboard into it, it's awesome. Is Searing Spear better than Boros Charm? You know, stuff like that. You know, are you supposed to be playing four frontline medics or four hunt masters? You know, those kind of numbers are, you know, up for debate. Am I supposed to have two wolf runs instead of maybe one township on wolf run? You know, minor minor uh, changes that can be made to kind of make things a little bit better. But overall, the concept is good. Um, and, I mean, every time he was on camera, he was just crushing it. So, I like the deck. Yeah, I talked about, like, I think almost all of those things independently a little earlier about this deck. Uh, the one thing you didn't say that I wanted to touch on super quickly before we went to Glenn is how do you feel about the number of, like, 
comes into play tapped lands like Clifftop Retreat and Rootbound Crag versus like one Sacred Foundry and two Stomping Grounds in this deck, because that strikes me as a little bit odd. Um, that part's a little bit scary. I think you're going to run into some mana issues, as you see. Yeah, there's three Clifftop Retreats and three Rootbound Crags, and like none of the. Do He's got four Temple Gardens and two Stomping Grounds and one Sacred Foundry. Um, for me, like just looking at that, it's something where I have to actually play the games, and then like you know when I get screwed over by Clifftop Retreat, I'm just going to go oh. That should probably be a Sacred Foundry instead. Like, I'm the aggro deck anyway. I can afford to take two points of damage. You know? I mean, again, those are just, like, those those minor changes. I mean, you're definitely bringing up a good point, though. I hadn't realized that upon first look. Yeah, it seems reasonable to me that, like, you want some number of those lands. Because, obviously, if you're playing a million dual lands, like, you're going to have a bunch of forests and planes. But it, yeah. this distribution seems suspect to me, just on first glance. I don't know. We'll see how it plays. Glenn, what do you think about Naya and this deck in particular? Uh, I... I think Nia Humans has been an interesting deck to watch evolve specifically, and a lot of the like things that seemed weird about the list of both of you guys, I think are really just Joseph gaming the very specific metagame of Atlanta, which was like he expected other people to be trying to attack him to death every single round. <laughs> like he's got, you know, main deck near Heath Pilgrim. He goes for Wolf Run over Gavney Township. Obviously that interaction with Near Heath Pilgrim seems a little better than townships, probably. If you're racing other aggro decks, I don't think you want to try and grind them out with all your tokens. You know, you want to just, once you have the advantage, get them dead in, like, two turns. Uh, when you move on to the lands, I think, like, personally, I think this deck will play a lot more shock lands going forward. I think he probably played it real cautiously with his, planning to just play a Pilgrim on two more frequently than one might expect, uh, and then just be lining up two, two casting cost spells or a four drop on three, rather than trying to curve out the gates with, like, turn two Silverblade Paladin or anything like that. Uh, and, and watching him play, I think that bore out. I didn't see a lot of Silverblade Paladin just getting jammed like ASAP. You know, it was like building a board, setting up, you know, pushing the opponent a little bit, and then using Paladin to just force them to deal with like two things in the same turn. Uh, my, my favorite part of the deck, which again, I think uh, definitely a concession to the aggressive metagame, are the Searing Spears that he added, which they did overdrive, obviously, against Brian Rondoon in the finals, but... I can only imagine how good they were, like, just all day in general. Taking down Hell Riders or Ash Zealots or whatever's just getting in your way and whatever your opponent might have been trying to race you with. And it's just a card no one expects from this deck right now, either. Like, everyone is familiar with the lists that were getting played, you know, and most of them didn't have Searing Spears. So I, I really like that call, and I think it that was one of the choices that panned out the best for him. Okay. Do you like this deck going forward? I think some version of this deck will remain a contender going forward. I think this specific list uh, will probably not stand the test of time as the format changes. Like I, I agree that Near Heath Pilgrim is probably not going to be industry standard, uh, but for this weekend, I imagine it gave him a bunch of free wins that his opponents were just baffled to see happening. <laughs> it seems like a fairly reasonable card to have in your 75 summer. It seems like a yeah. card where when it's good, it's like completely insane. Right. All right, Steven, what do you think about Naya and this deck in particular? Yeah, so I'm not completely sold on the archetype moving forward as like a particularly, well, I think it's a particularly strong aggro archetype, sure, but I'm not sure that it's the strongest or anything. I think that the most attractive thing about this color combination and the cards that are available to us is the ability to play an aggressive deck, which can be other aggressive decks with controlling and life gaining sort of elements. And like that's exactly what he did, I think. And I think Glenn was explaining that pretty well. But the ability to have access to Huntmaster to like even Thalia is not that bad just as a first striker, but Restoration Angel on near Heath Pilgrim. And yeah, you have some removal. I I think there's a great deck choice for last weekend. And I'm not really convinced that it's going to continue to be a great deck as the format moves forward. Let's talk Human Reanimator then. Uh, obviously, Brian Brondwin did very well with Human Reanimator. I think Brad Nelson also did fairly well with that deck. Uh, how do you feel about this deck, and is this, is this the best rights deck going forward? Have we seen the last of Angel of Serenity? From that deck. Cedric, begin. Alright, party people, listen up. 
it's it's you gotta play graveyard hate. You can't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you even told them like last yeah. week. You were like, you're not gonna do it, and it's gonna yeah. beat you. And then yeah. they didn't listen. This has got to stop here because we saw this. Uh, yeah, Glenn, you weren't with me in San Diego. Uh, Ruben was, but when um, when Joe Lissette won the tournament, he didn't lose a match. And like you know, I talked to Joe uh, like during the tournament. He's just like, no one has anything. This is just so easy. It's like. <laughs> He's like, I've had no resistance. I haven't gotten close to losing. And it's just like, yeah, if no one has nothing, you just can't lose. And his deck is just in overdrive. And that's what happened with uh, with BBD this weekend. Every time we watched him, and like the big one was the quarterfinal match where he was against the, the four color token deck. At no point, there had to be like the Super Bowl lights going out incident. And then even then, like I don't think he could have lost. The tokens, just, the tokens deck is just like, I'm going to grind you out. Here it yeah. comes. I don't think there's any situation that exists where the token deck could actually be. I think like if BBD mult to three, like he could still probably come back and win. Like that's how lopsided the match felt. And again, this is what happens when like people just don't have any graveyard hate in their sideboard. Um, you know, it, it sucks that like you're maybe you're just supposed to jam a whole bunch of rest in peace or or something like. But you have to have something because if you ignore this deck, you're just dead. I mean, it has an infinite combo in it now too that is very easy for it to put together. So you have to have like Deathrite Shaman or you know Purify the Grave, Rest in Peace if you want to get extreme Tormod script from the red decks. You have to have something. You keep ignoring like a deck like this, you're just going to get crushed. It's just the way it is, and it's a deck that I personally don't feel uh, stands up to hate very well because it's not like a uh, it can, like, go through cards and stuff, but, it, you know, I don't think it's, like, you know, like, your modern type deck where it's, like, okay, like, my opponent's going to have this hate card, so I'm going to board this hate card in and, like, take care of it and then keep going. I don't feel like it's, it's a deck that can do that. Uh, when it's up when it's up against hate, I think it's pretty bad. Um, but when it's not up against hate, it's the best deck, not close, I think. And, and do, you think, do you think that Angel of Serenity is no longer, like, we're not going to see that variant of the right stack anymore? Like, it's just going to be all... Reckoning all the time. Yeah, that part's weird. I don't know. Angel Serenity has just fallen off like crazy, just from like all strategies, which is a little bit surprising. Um, I don't know where we're gonna see that moving forward. Again, like it, it's it's hard to imagine um, not just playing Angel Glory's Rise with like this human chain and all the things that you can do with it. It's a lot more synergistic uh, with Angel Glory's Rise and all the humans in it. Plus, the humans contribute to the combo. So um, I don't really know. If there's a reason to be playing Angel Serenity right now, so I guess my short answer is uh, no, we're not going to see much of that soon, which is weird for how powerful that card is. Right. Glenn, Human Reanimator, right stacks. Yeah, I think we will definitely be seeing uh, Angel of Serenity coming back in. I agree that this deck is, you know, it's all in and it's more explosive, and what it does definitely wins the game uh, much fiercer than previous right decks. But like Cedric said, it is vulnerable to hate, which is the same thing that was true of Angel of Glory's Rise decks like in the previous format. Like, they were around. You know, like, Chronic Flooding was a thing. And that's just, that deck was all in on that. It folded to, it folded to hate pretty, pretty hard. But if you weren't hating on it, it was doing some pretty robust stuff. Uh, so this deck, same kind of issue. And when you have the hate kind of surging forward, I think there's a space for an Umbero Rights deck that can actually operate without relying heavily on the graveyard on barrel rights interaction which we saw a lot of junk reanimator belt builds boarding into uh, where they would take out their rights and just transition into this like mid-rangey junk deck with angel of serenity on the top end grizzly salvage obviously not insane but it's doing a little something especially when you're starting with deathrite shaman in your deck already stuff like that uh, so i think there is a space for that deck to exist sort of as the format oscillates between like hating on reanimator and not hating on reanimator uh, those decks will sort of exist on opposite sides of the axis as far as playability goes, uh, just rotating into and out of favor, probably. Okay. All right, Stephen, do you have thoughts on this deck in particular, an Angel of Serenity? Yeah, I, I think that this may be like the keystone of the format right now. I don't know if keystone is quite the right metaphor, but. The thing about Reanimator is that some color combinations for aggressive decks and some aggressive deck builds are able to incidentally hate it out. Like, Deathrite Shaman is a very, very obvious example of, like, if you have that card, you're just incidentally going to be much better against Reanimator than if you don't, and it may not be enough to win the game on its own, but access to that card against Reanimator is giving you huge amounts of equity without losing you a ton of equity when you're playing against other decks or anything. 
So I think if the form is going to start off as aggressive decks, and we have like all the dual ones now, so they're you can play any aggressive deck, like just pick some colors, pick three, pick four if you want. I don't know. Um, I think you may see that the decks like. We saw a deck which incidentally had a lot of equity against other aggressive decks because it could play controlish, winning this weekend. And I think that if Reanimator is going to be a big deal, I think that the color combinations of aggro, which can incidentally have a lot of equity against Reanimator, may be the ones that end up defining the format. And once you have one aggro deck, which is defining the format more so than a huge, like a plethora of different aggro decks. At that point, you can start pointing at that aggro deck and saying, okay, I'm going to beat a mid range deck and beat this. Or maybe even I'm going to build a full control deck and beat this. So I think Reanimator, as it's like a very, very powerful strategy which has to be answered, but can be answered. I think that the fact that Reanimator can be answered is going to like, we're going to see all sorts of evolutions out of that fact. Okay. Uh, as you mentioned, I want to touch a little bit on just sort of three color aggro in general before segueing to a couple different decks. Uh, there were a number of different three color aggro decks at this tournament. There were a couple that didn't make the top eight that perhaps should be noted. The bug tempo deck specifically is probably my favorite random three color aggro deck from this top 32. Um, but yeah, how do you guys feel about the variety of different three-color aggro decks? There was obviously a Naya aggro deck, a Jund aggro deck, and then we see sort of bug aggro. I think there were some different... The Esper Spirits deck is basically a three-color aggro deck, I think. Um, do you guys have any thoughts just about sort of three-color aggro and where it's going? Said, I will start with you. Um, you know, three-color aggro, I think, is where we're going to be moving... Uh, going forward, now of course there can be mono red um, as far as like a more traditional aggro deck. The thing about three color aggro is that it's almost like your third color is kind of a free roll um, with how much mana fixing there is available between the ten like uh, Ravnica dual lands and then your uh, your M13 dual lands. Um, there's so much mana fixing available that you can basically get your third color in there for free, which is pretty nice. And as and as you're able to do that, it'll increase the power level of your deck accordingly. Um, you know, the deck that I, I keep going back to that I just really like the most as far as these three-color aggro decks are considered is that Experiment Jun deck because it does make the best use of Experiment of experiment 1. Um, it, it seems like it makes the best use of Flinthoof Boar, which is a great aggro card. Same with Dreg Mangler. Um, and then it's got Hellrider in there as well. And maybe, you know, you're supposed to be playing Falkenrath Aristocrat instead of Hellrider. Who knows? You know, there can be some tweaking done in that particular deck list. But, you know, the big thing for me is that I think any three-color aggro deck that's going to be successful is going to incorporate Abrupt Decay. Um, and the reason I feel that way is because I think Abrupt Decay is just one of, it, it's probably the best removal spell now. Uh, Searing Spear is right up there with it, but Abrupt Decay being able to kill Boros Reckoner and, and just all of the low drop creatures, no questions asked, is I think why that is probably going to be the removal spell of choice moving forward. Yes, it doesn't interact with Restoration Angel, that part of it sucks, but besides that, you know, that's the only real creature that I think that, um, it doesn't inter interact with favorably for what an aggro deck is trying to accomplish. You can make the argument of, you know, it doesn't kill Thraktusk either, but I think once you get to the Thraktusk part of the game, it's a different situation entirely. As far as trying to give the beatdowns before they can get to Thraktusk range, I think that Abrupt Decay is that awesome removal spell, and it's going to be awesome in those three-color aggro mirrors. So I think the three-color aggro is going to be what people are going to be doing moving forward outside of your mono-red players, um, and I think it makes sense to, um, for people to be doing that. Okay. Glenn, do you have any three-color aggro thoughts? Yeah, I agree that it's becoming closer and closer to a free roll as we sit on, you know, all the shock lands and all the buddy lands, which are actually, I think, really great tools to just have in a standard format. Um, interestingly, you know, it's actually gotten to the point where cards like Ghost Quarter or, like, accidentally strip mine, which has come up for me on Moto already a couple times, where, you know, I just, someone played their Alchemist Refuge or whatever, and I was like, ah, yeah. Sure, go sort of that, and then they just don't have anything, and I'm like, oh, well, that's not good. Uh, so I, th I think that might be, like, a real thing. Like, there are decks that will be doing that. Like, look at, uh, you know, Chihoy's blue-white-red deck that we talked about earlier. I'm pretty sure he doesn't have any basics. Uh, that's a real thing, you know. You might accidentally just get somebody. Uh, that said, I think that three-color decks are going to be, by and large, better than two-color decks. 
whereas monocolor offers you know certain benefits depending on what you're going. So I think we're going to not see very many two color decks. You're kind of have to going to make your piece on whether you want to be monocolor or three colors. And for the record, I don't consider things like uh, Andrew Schneider's red deck splashing Boros charm to be like a genuine two color deck. You know that's not really the thing. Even Saito's deck is it's a bit of a reach to call that a two color deck, even though it's basically it, it does have you know eight spells that have green in them. Uh, so. I think that's what we're going to see, like mono maybe with a little bit of a splash, or three, even four colors maybe, uh, if people are getting especially crazy. Hybrid mana, depending on which cards wind up being playable with it, can really affect that. And uh, Abrupt Decay is a great solution to a lot of cards in this format, as Cedric said. Uh, the awkward spot being that it's a really bad solution to some other cards in the format, like Hellrider and Thunder My Hellkite. So I think you're going to have to keep mixing up your removal uh, as far as those cards go. Like, you can't just jam in for Abrupt Decay. You're probably going to have to go like two Abrupt Decay, two Ultimate Price, something like that. Uh, but at the same time, that's a perfectly fine suite of removal. Like, I'd be happy with that. So. Alrighty. Steven? Yeah, I agree with everything that's being said. I think the most interesting thing to me about having a bunch of three-color aggro decks is that where usually you would start with an archetype, like Mono Red, and you can make whatever fiddly changes you want with that archetype. You can take out a four of and add a different four of. You can drop two cards and add two different one ups whatever. When you have three color decks, like you're always playing tricolor, you're going to see, instead, people are going to be dropping packages. They're going to drop a color from their deck and add a different color. So you might drop white from your deck and add black or something like that. and the result of that is that as a deck builder, you're going to be looking more so at like, I'm going to drop eight cards, these exact eight cards, to add these eight cards. Or I sort of want to drop this four up, but if I do drop that four up, I have to drop another four up, etc. I think that it's sort of a unique deck building situation. It's also a unique situation from the point of an analyst of deck lists, just because it's almost to a point where you cannot talk about, like, there are these three colors, and so that's what deck this is. I feel like perhaps we should be looking at, like, a defining card in the deck and saying, I don't know, this is Baros Ragnar based aggro. Or perhaps we should be looking at where exactly the curve is and saying, like, this is a mid-range deck with eight removal versus this is a lower deck with six burn. Stuff like that starts to be like more where the differences in the format are. Yeah. You just we're just all gonna we're gonna dogpile on the Star City naming conventions. That's where it's all coming <laughs> back to. Dude, there is almost no mid range in there, except for once you get out of the top eight, which is where all the mid range decks want to die. <laughs> that would be down. <laughs> no, I think I think we did okay. We have like humans, we have aggro, tokens, spirits. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about spirits because I think that deck's neat, and I want to know what you guys think. Cedric, what do you think about the Esper Spirits deck played by Eddie Walker to eight? Glenn, you and I covered this match, right? Yeah. 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 yeah it was me and you when uh, Pat was on break. Um, so I think that there's a deck here. I don't know what the deck is supposed to look like, but it feels like there is probably a deck here. And the reason that there's a deck here is because Ozadat is wow. Wow, is that a good magic card? <laughs> Jeez. If you can get into a situation where the board is kind of even, uh, or you're a little bit ahead, my God, is Oza that good? And we saw that in uh, in the matchup that we covered with Eddie Walker. I think, like, the first game, I think he just cast it, and then his opponent could do nothing and lost. And then, like, the third game, he ended up top-decking it when he was, like, kind of behind on the board, and then it just changed everything. And like the two life he gained was important. It like could get in front of the Thrag Tusk or whatever. Like it just had like a huge impact on the board. Um, also saw a match with Dave Thomas cast it uh, against his opponent in a control mirror, and he just like blinked it out, and then his opponent's just like, uh and then just like couldn't win. Um, this is a good card. You know, it being five mana doesn't really mean that it's gonna be an aggressive based card, because it does cost five mana, but this is a good magic card, and I think that would be like the top of the curve for a spirit deck. Um, having Drogskull Captain come back is a little bit interesting, because uh, that card has fallen off 
like big time for how powerful it is. And the the, the, the issue with this deck is that its glut is that it's, is that it's three drop. Um, it has guys St. Traff, it has Troxel Captain, it has Lingering Souls, it has this huge glut at the three drop. Doesn't really get started early in the first couple of turns. Um, but I feel like that there is probably a deck that you just have to kind of spread out the curve a little bit because it was so three heavy. And then his two drops were like um, the black white charm and Azorius charm, so he can get into the mid game. So it feels kind of mid rangey instead of being really aggro. Um, but uh, it, I, I feel like there's a way to make it work because Drug Skull Captain is such a good card. It just doesn't have those clones to go with it like it had before in Phantasmal Image and, uh, and a Phyrexian Metamorph. It actually just has the card clone now. So um, at the end of the day, I think the most important thing is that Obsidat is like a, a, an insane card and happens to be a spirit. So then it works with Cavern of Souls, and you can maybe make a deck around you know that that concept, I think. All righty. Glenn, do you have spirit-related thoughts? Yeah, that deck definitely looked sweet. Uh, the card that I found kind of interesting for it was Blind Obedience, which I really like as a way to just make Geist of Saint Trapped much harder to control. Uh, it'll really force your opponents to kind of pick whether they want to race or not, and when you're playing, I mean, obviously Extort in and of itself is pretty good if you're trying to race somebody. Uh, but Obs of that big deal as he can play offense and kind of defense even very well. Uh, and the cards that blue, white, and black have access to, specifically Azorius Charm, are excellent modular cards when you're attacking or defending, depending on whether you want to you know, put the guy on top or maybe bash in for seven and give your guys lifelink. Uh, so I think that there's probably something there. That said, uh, it really needs stuff to do on turns one and two that aren't play land and pass, as we saw Eddie doing in the feature match arena. Obviously, blind obedience like sort of qualifies as one of those things, although you don't get really much value from it until probably turn four to seven. Like that's when you start really banking that one. Uh, so I, I'm reluctant to call it a two drop since it doesn't really do anything for a pretty long time. Uh, that said, yeah, may, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but I do think it needs some more stuff, basically, uh, specifically some cheap end stuff to actually keep the deck alive. Alrighty, Steven. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely agree that I, I just think the curve in this deck should be much lower. I don't know exactly what you put in it, but I'm not sure that it matters that much. Does that make sense? Like, I think whichever low-end cards you choose for this deck are not going to be super impactful. You're not expecting them to win you the game or anything. I just think your deck is strong enough once you reach later turns that you can throw away a couple of cards in your hand to do something on turns one and two. Um, I don't know. I would try playing Delver in this deck because I'm me. <laughs> God. Why not, man? Why not? Oh, like, oh, honestly, oh. if it's just going to be a 1-1 one, one for one, that's better than having three cards in your hand when they kill you on turn four. Like, Yeah, that... I Suppose that's true, just it's so you. It is very me. What do we have? We have 15 spells, so it's gonna flip in like three turns. <laughs> yep, it sure will. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, Gloom Surgeon is a spirit. Ooh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Kinda, I don't know. I sort of. I like this deck because it's called Spirits, but it feels like it's a bunch of cards that are incidentally Spirits. Like, <laughs> it's a bunch of creatures which all happen to be Spirits, so hooray. And yeah, Droxel Captain is here because... Eh, might as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, yes. I'm not yes. convinced that he has to be there, even. I think that Droxel Captain is kind of impressive if you're expecting your opponents to be like Azorius charming you, but... I don't think that's what people are doing right now, so that's kind of a concern. Thank God. <laughs> I was f hate that card. Alright, let's... I think we've covered uh, the first week of Gatecrash Standard fairly well. Let us move on to the Legacy Open, which was won by Tony Chu with Jund. In a top eight of three Jun decks, one Belcher deck, one Show and Tell, one Blue White Miracles, one Merfolk, and one Esper Stoneblade. And also, perhaps worthy of mention, was that all three Jun decks were in the top four. So as our, as is our practice with Legacy, we will do the Legacy grab bag. We are still Kazulis at this time. Cedric, 
pick a legacy thing. Belcher! <laughs> Finals! I wish, I wish God, Griffin would have won. Was, that was literally the only thing that anybody <laughs> had to choose. Yep. I wish it was in the finals. Makes me sad. Um, so I, I was talking to uh, the so Griffin. Griffin has never played Belcher before, uh, and ended up making the uh, the finals of the tournament. And it was it is a deck that is incredibly well positioned right now in Legacy. Um, and this is something that we talked about during the broadcast too. Just uh, you know, just just the fact that there are less force of wills and force of wills are being moved to the sideboard, and uh, people are playing Punishing Fire. In Legacy. That's actually happening right now. Punishing Fire. And if that's a thing, it is time for the fun police to show up and kaboom you. So, <laughs> that is what uh, I think Griffin did over the course of the day. So, as Tony Chu was playing against him, he kept rubbing his hands together and just going like, Okay, don't kill me, don't kill me, don't kill me. Like, <laughs> is, that, is that a comfortable feeling in a game of Magic? You know, just hoping that you're not dead the whole time. Griffin, Griffin, you know, made some mistakes um, while he was playing the deck. I think there was a, a turn in the mid game of turn uh, in the middle of game one where he didn't realize he could kill his opponent because of desperate ritual splashing onto another desperate ritual. But you know, the first time playing the deck, you don't see the inter all the interactions right away. I've played the deck for like a, over a year and a half, so you know, I know a lot of the interactions with the deck. Whatever, it's fine. Um, you know, the, the fact that he got second place is, I think, the the more important point of the tournament, and that this deck is, uh, you know, it's a deck that everyone hates, uh, kind of, that it exists, but it is a really good deck right now. And, you know, what people are going to look at for this tournament is they're going to go, oh, man, three punishing Jun decks in the top four? All right, let's find more ways to beat the Jun Mirror. And that means you're going to get kaboomed if that's going to happen. <laughs> that's just what's going to happen. So I, I don't advocate playing Belcher all the time, like when Rug was the best deck. You know, you're going to get crushed and embarrassed, and when counterbalance is a thing, you're going to get ruined. But when people are actually playing Grove of the Burn Willows and Punishing Fire and, you know, trying to find ways to beat each other in... I, I swear to God, if people start casting Huntmasters and shit to win the Junmir, they're going to get the biggest taste of the cannon, and they, and they deserve it, honestly, if that's, if that's where we end up going. So I think that Belcher was an excellent choice. Um, if I get to play in a legacy tournament soon, that's what I'm going to play, as long as people are playing Punishing Fire and other such nonsense. So that's it. All right, while we're talking about the Belcher deck, I was having a discussion with Steven uh, yesterday. So that the Show and Tell deck that was in the top eight has literally no way to win except to cast Show and Tell. Like, yeah. His backup plan is hard cast Omniscience. Like, I know some Show and Tell decks play Sneak Attack or whatever, but this one is, like, just doesn't. So if he played the Belcher player, what does Can't he do? Win. Like he just casts Show and Tell and is like, I hope I don't die, and then just dies every time. <laughs> like, if the Belcher player puts an LED in play and they're just like, do do your worst, bro. That's exactly what happened in the uh, the quarterfinals. Really? Yeah, he in game two. Well, game one, Ryan made an aggressive choice to Burning Wish for uh, Show and Tell instead of for Pyroclasm when he had like needed just one more piece for the kill. And then after he got beat down by like six goblins for a long time, he bur found another burning wish to pyroclasm, and then died to an elver spirit guide attacking him. Yeah. <laughs> so that was awkward. But uh, in game two, yeah, the Belcher player kept just turn one, played Lion's Eye Diamond, and passed. And then on turn three, Ryan just you know shrugged, yeah. decided he had to go for it. <laughs> Showing <and> Tom <laughs> Belcher, that is like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kaboom! <laughs> Oh, that's that is rich. That is. So You're welcome to read the uh, the recap of that particular tale in the written coverage. Uh, I, I wish, <laughs> if I didn't know that was the case, I wish we would have had it on camera. It would have been so funny. <laughs> oh man, that's great. That is great. All right, good. I'm glad we got that story out there. Okay, Glenn. <laughs> the legacy grab bag. You get to pick a thing. I get to pick a thing. Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, it was it was not a great. Uh, not I shouldn't say it was a great tournament. We had a lot of decks. It was kind of weird that we had John not only doing so well but also like winning through a Belcher deck. Uh, yeah, I saw some interesting stuff. There were a couple different zombies decks. Uh, Sam Black's version or something very similar to it. I believe top sixteen. I'm finding that now. Uh, yeah, Charles Smith was playing pretty close to what Sam has been championing for a while. 
so that's worth noting. Uh, someone else played a Jun version with Venge Vines that we had on camera. That deck looks sweet. Uh, probably not like actually that great, but sweet. Very sweet. So I, I guess watch out for Carrion Feeder is my, my legacy grab bag. <laughs> keep, keep an eye on the little guy. Okay. And one thing that I forgot to mention about the Legacy Open is that there were, in fact, zero cards from Gate Crash in the entire top eight. In all 875s, zero Gate Crash cards. So it's they're moving in slowly. I'm That's stumped. not too surprising. <laughs> yep. Moving in slowly. <laughs> no. I think we were uniform in our claims that they would not be in Legacy, so we were we were vindicated in that particular claim. Steven, Legacy us. We're gonna go to the sideboard. Ooh, one of, and uh, this the show and tell top eight deck. We have a one of Army of the Damned. And now, like, I have my theory, but I want to hear why you guys think there's an Army of the Damned in this guy's sideboard. Uh, I'm guessing. Hmm. I was gonna say like ivory mask or something like that but that doesn't really make any sense because you could just get like time of need and then emerald them so there's probably some obvious answer but it's not coming to mind for me do you guys have any thoughts i uh, haven't got i've got actual nothing i'm sure there's some random thing okay i think there's a very clear answer okay and the answer okay. is that once you go off you're infinite right so you can cast Army of the Damned as well before you kill them. Else. <laughs> also, zombies. <laughs> Eat them all. All right, you win. I guess. How did you not Trump empty the Warrens? As one of our, our chat members posted. <laughs> how did, how yeah, did you not guess. call it Crush of Zombie Bears? Because that's like what that card is called. Uh, yeah, I actually want the story behind that now. What what if he actually just has some warped up reason? He's like, no man, in my I feel like there is some random reason. I don't know. There's there's probably something. Somewhere. To defend your Ember Cruel against uh, no, never mind. <laughs> yeah, like maybe they have Caracas or something? I don't know. Oh that kinda makes uh, sense. No, then you just burn it. Take an extra turn? No! That's they have not Caracas true. if they have Caracas and Ivory Mask. Then we need these zombies. No, actually, I was joking. You still just recast your Emrakul off Omniscience and kill them. Like, yeah, they die. Oh, yeah, okay, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Maybe they have, like, Ensnaring Bridge Ivory Mask and three cards in their hand. Or more. <laughs> but not 15. Sure. Well, then we need, like, we need Army of the Damned and we need, um, what was that card from Trade Secrets? The one that draws them cards from uh, the yeah. Onslaught Rare? They can rare. choose not to, I think, though. Can't oh, no, you have to draw at least the first four, I think. Yeah. So. Got them. <laughs> yeah. I think I would rather run the, the Words of Wisdom <laughs> or something, though. Right? Or There's something like one of the skeins, maybe? I didn't think the I'd blue skeins? Vision skeins, I think it is? Skeins? Uh, if that is the case... Vision stains. Like, if it's vision because stains. Of, <laughs> if it's because of Ivory Mask plus... Rage? How do you not, like, just go for Merchant of Secrets or a Tog? Like... Do you think it was done so we could have this ridiculous conversation right now? I and hope try so. To, yeah, and try to figure out why this would happen? Because that's what it feels like, like me. These are the things I really appreciate from Legacy players. <laughs> the, the one of Army of the Damned at the sideboard. That's what makes my day. I don't know. That's the one of Crush of Zombie Bears is very good. I really enjoy trying to figure out how this deck beats beats Char Vulture. I think right, it can it can sort of hard cast some missions. But yeah, I, I think you're just on the hard cast plan. Like you just tr try and keep a hand with two Force of Wills and then sit there playing lands for like nine turns. This actually happened uh, to MJ at the Star City Games uh, the Invitational in Atlanta, um, where he was playing Saito's Hypergenesis deck. And he's playing against Show and Tell missions, and if they ever cast hype, if they ever cast Show and Tell, which is the only thing they can do, anything he puts into play is better than his opponent, especially because he has Angel of Despair in his deck. And he had four copies of Except that. Except for so Goblin Charbelcher, of course. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, 
So MJ is playing with hypergenesis, and this guy's playing show and tell. And like game one, the guy catches show and tell, and then he's like, "Yep, Angel." The guy's like, "Jesus, sorry, you win." And then um, like wins game two somehow, and then game three. MJ just has three angel despairs in his hand. He keeps his opening hand of like one land, three angel. He's got 24 lands in his deck, like all the double lands, like Surprise and Scary, Remote Farm, all this stuff. And he doesn't play, he plays two lands the entire game. And his opponent just is like, yep, you know, like Burning Wish for Petals of Insight to find lands. You know, this searches out like all his lands, taps 10 mana, casts Omniscience, and kills him. And MJ's just like, you have to be kidding me. This cannot be happening. Meanwhile, MJ has like, um, he has, like, you know, hypergenesis and, like, all this stuff in his hand. He's just like, yeah, okay, man. This is really okay. I guess I'm just not supposed to win today. Yeah. Actually happened. I think that's the only way you can be Belcher, is they have to get to 10 mana and cast the cast the old omniscience. Hmm. Well, it's going to be a challenge. I mean, they have 20 lands, but a bunch of those are fetches. Like, they only have six fetchable lands in this... Oh, seven, seven fetchable lands in this deck? Oh, there's Lotus Petals. Right. Well, there's two Lotus Petals, <laughs> and there's two City of Traitors and three Ancient Tombs, so it's possible, but challenging. Burning Wish for the Petals. Clear things up. Yeah. Make sure you get there. I mean, we couldn't... Unfortunately, we don't have access to Concentrate in our sideboard, but this will have to do. Uh, uh, like... Uh, what a Maybe that's what Army of the Damned is for. It's two less mana. Ooh. Yeah, we're going long... They don't only have to get to eight. But doesn't that cost, like, quad black or something? It and does it cost... destroys Empty the Warrens. Absolutely destroys it. It does cost three black mana, which is something our deck cannot yeah, make. There's no way to produce that in our we deck. to fix the mana base, man. Yep. You should have was... a talk with them. Contact yeah. them on Facebook. Was... <laughs> we could have cast this Gristlebrand, but we also yep. can't cast that monster because it costs four black. So <laughs> Let them know that there's an issue with this deck building. All right. Well, good, good legacy grab bag, everyone. Army Wee. of the Damned was was a good find. <laughs> All right, let us do shoutouts and get out of dodge. We have been almost exactly an hour, so let's let us do the business. Uh, yeah, Cedric, begin. Okay. Uh, today we uh we just arrived back from Atlanta after doing the uh, open series with Patrick Sullivan and Glenn. Had a good time out there in the dirty south, got to eat some Chick-fil-A for the first time and God knows how long. So, uh, enjoyed that. Uh, I'll be streaming this week. Not sure what I'm going to be doing. Probably cute for the first couple of days. I hear that Gatecrash comes out. I, I hear varying things about when Gatecrash comes out. Is it Wednesday or is it Friday? Do you guys know? Sorry? I don't know. Gatecrash? You've gone on Wednesday, I believe. How, how about Gatecrash? When does Gatecrash come to the party? Gatecrash releases Friday. Okay. And is Friday. that like the pre-releases start on Friday? Yeah, that's the pre-release starting. From okay. Okay. Well, then, I, uh, I will uh, be cubing, I suppose, this week. And, uh, I mean, Red Green Tron's getting a little bit old for people, but I just love playing it. Uh, and my buddy, uh, Tommy Ashton, made top four of the online PTQ yesterday with it. So uh, I still think it's pretty good, so I think I'm going to be battling with that. And then I'll be going to Edison this week. Um, for the Star City Games Open Series out there in Edison, New Jersey, doing commentary with Zach Hall. So that's what my week looks like. Appreciate you guys watching. And, uh, yeah, kick it on over to Glenn. Is that, uh, that's Stainerson, right? Ashton? That is Stainerson, yes, sir. Didn't he, yeah. Hasn't he, like, top at every Moto, like, modern PTQ online? Like, just got them all? Yeah, he's just awesome at magic. Caught them all. All right. Cashed, uh, like last season, cashed all four Pro Tours. Hates going to Grand Prix, so he was two points short of being on the train. <laughs> he refuses to play in Grand Prix. He's just like, I don't care. They're stupid. There's too many people. So, yeah, he should be like on the choo choo. He's really good. All right. Glenn, shout out. All right. Well, uh, I have the weekend off. Ruben will be doing Edison, not me. Uh, so I'm going to be playing some actual magic, probably. I'm going to do a modern PTQ uh, in Asheville, North Carolina on Sunday. Not really sure what I'm going to play. I don't know how much the bands will change things. I don't think it'll change them much. Gatecrash, I definitely don't think will change things much. Uh, I know that I, I would like to be casting counterspells, as they seem pretty good right now. Uh, but haven't really haven't found that, that magic you know, number yet. So we're going to be testing this week, and I'll probably be streaming some cube and modern in between bouts of actually doing that in real life. So, uh, that's my plan for the next seven days. Alright, Steven. 
I want to warn you guys real quick that I may stream a cube draft oh my at some God. point in the next week. So watch out for it. Watch out for it. Uh, I'm very excited about standard right now. That's like my big, my big sweet tooth at the moment. I think it's a very, very interesting format. I'm just going to evolve in really interesting ways. Uh, other than that, thanks for watching. And yeah, tune in next week. See you guys then. All right. Yep. Thanks for watching, everyone. I will see you later. We will be back uh, next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye.